the scientific work of Michael Faraday, son of a blacksmith, and in his youth, a journeyman book. His experiments and researches had never been made. The mechanism of our modern life might have been entirely different. For instance, I doubt if I should have been able to speak to you by means of the talking film, as I'm doing now. Michael was born in London in 1791. He had none of the advantages of modern education. At the age of 13, he was entered as a newsboy into the service of a Mr. Rebo, a bookseller and bookbinder of Blandford Street. Uh, a year later, he was taken on as an apprentice to the bookbinding trade. He was very anxious to improve himself and he seized the advantages which his business gave him because he read deeply in the books that were brought to his master's shop to be bound. He tells us himself that his interest in electricity was aroused by his reading an article on electricity in the Encyclopedia Britannica. In 1812, a good chance befell him. A friend of his gave him tickets by which he could go to the lectures at the Royal Institution of Sir Humphrey Davy, who was the inventor of the miners' safety lamp, and was then at the height of his fame. Faraday took careful notes of these lectures. He wrote them out in his beautiful script and bound them all into a book. Here is the very book which is still preserved. You see his beautiful handwriting. This book he took to Davis, Davy, and Davy was very interested. Faraday asked him if he mightn't enter in some means upon a scientific career. Davy tried to dissuade him, saying that probably the book binding would pay him better. But a little while afterwards it happened that Davy had to dismiss his assistant, and so he sent for Faraday. A chaise and pair invaded the little street where Faraday lived, and a footman descended from the box, and there was a note from Mr. Faraday asking him to come to the Royal Institution, and there he was engaged at the rate of 25 shillings a week and two rooms in the top of the house, and began his scientific career as bottle washer, Mr. Humphrey Davy. Now, at that time, Faraday entered upon his experimental work and rapidly showed a great aptitude for it. In fact, it wasn't many years before he had advanced so far as to succeed Sir Humphrey Davy. Faraday was particularly interested in the relation between magnetism and electricity. One such relation was known in his day. I can illustrate it in this way. If I join up this wire to the, to the uh, battery here, then the current of electricity runs through the coil, this coil. And at this you see that the coil has a magnetic effect. And if I put this piece of iron in the coil, you see the effect is too great to look how violent it is now. In fact, I can put it into these nails, and you see I can draw a file from out of the cup. But Faraday was convinced that there must be some other connection between magnetism and electricity than this which I've just tried to show to you. He had tried to find this connection, and at last he was the one to succeed. Here is the coil, and here is what we call a galvanometer, an instrument for recording the passage of a current. You see that when this magnet here lies along so inside the coil, nothing happens, the needle is quite upright. But if I take the magnet and push it into the coil, you see the needle kick. Now I pull it out again, you see it kicks violently again. Thus you see the magnet has an effect in generating electric current, and that is the simple basis. Dynamos, motors, all the mechanism of modern electrical engineering springs from that. That's the important point. It took the genius of Faraday to find it, and then to work out its principles, and then to make it plain to the public. Let us picture to ourselves Faraday working in his laboratory on August the 29th, 1831, the day on which success came to him. We have pictures from which it has been possible to reconstruct the theater in which he gave his lectures and did many of his experiments. He's now trying the experiment I've just been describing. Though his arrangement is a little more difficult to explain and to understand, also it is comparatively primitive. 
Pierce takes an iron ring and round two coils upon it. There is bare copper wire, the various turns being kept apart by string and tape. There was no inserted wire to be bought in those days. This ring is still preserved at the Royal Institution. He connects one coil to the ends of a wire, passing over a magnetic compass some distance away. He joins the other coil to a battery. Do you see a little movement of the compass just when he makes this last connection? Let's suppose that he missed that. The needle is back in its old place, and by the time that Faraday looks at it, and he does not realize that anything has happened, he stops to think. Then perhaps he breaks the connection, and happens to be looking at the needle at the right moment, and he sees the needle move. How excited he must be. After trying it over and over again, he goes to his desk to write in his diary. And here is the actual page as he wrote it a century ago. This was the beginning of great scientific development and of industries employing millions of men. Let's picture to ourselves one other experiment that he did. He is pondering over this strange influence that a magnet can exert in his neighborhood, and he tries to examine it by placing a card over the magnet and scattering iron filings upon the card. Others have done this before, but it didn't mean to them what it now means to Faraday. See how beautifully the filings arrange themselves. Faraday supposed that these mapped out the lines of force of the magnet, as he called them, and as electrical engineers have called them ever since. Finally, let's picture to ourselves some of the consequences of Faraday's work. Think of a powerhouse, of a factory with the motors running, of trams and trains, of a magnetic crane, of a telephone exchange, of the X-ray room in a hospital, of water power generating current, of telegraphs and cables and wireless, and see how great all these consequences are. Now, I have no time to describe you more of Faraday's work, but I hope I have said enough to make you realize what a great Englishman this was, and what a right we have to be proud of. And you will understand, I am sure, the interest attached by exhibitors and by electricians all the world over at the Citizens' Scenery held in 1931.